Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the final week of topology. Thanks for coming. Thanks for watching uh, online. So this week is purely on knots. So we'll see more knotty things. Um, and I will have one more video for you and we try to discover more about the field of knot theory. So the big difference between knot theory and uh, surfaces is that for surfaces we had a full classification in the end. So I gave you a full classification of surfaces which is this DPT classification depending on the number of boundary disks, uh, projective planes or cross caps, whatever you want to call them, and handles. And the classification of knots is simply out of reach. So knot theory is still a pretty much an open and exciting field of uh, mathematics and we can just kind of try to get as many invariants as we can and remember invariant just means whatever we calculate some number for example the number of three colorings for a knot and if those numbers are not the same uh, what is a good notation for a knot maybe L then we can conclude that K is not, equals, not equal to L but if they are the same we can't say anything so um, since there are zillions of knots I'm going to show you kind of <laughs> an attempt to show you at least uh, quite a few knots. Um, usually having one of them is not enough. They're not fine enough, so we just study a few of them. So we'll, we'll see three in total. So one of them is uh, three coloring. And we will see two others during this week. And eventually, if I show you a picture of a knot and I ask is this young knot, you apply one of those. And well, hopefully it doesn't give you, give you a trivial result. So you can actually then check that it's not the unknown. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And I remind you of uh, the Reitermeister moves. So the most important uh, moves in this field were the Reitermeister moves. Let me just pull up a picture for you again. Um, so everything is locally determined by just those three local rules. At the zeros one, you can count it or not, so it's just saying we can bend everything as much as we want. And that's kind of the only way to really be sure that two knots are the same or not, because they're the same if and only if, it's an if and only if statement, they can be related by a sequence of randomized moves. Um, that's not always trivial, so I give you two examples here. So the first one is the unknot, maybe a little bit of staring on it, we convince you that it is the unknot. And those two knots that you see at the bottom, K and K prime, are actually the same knots, although they have quite different projections. So, um, and it, it's really highly recommended to do this yourself at one point. Try to show that these are um, the same. In this case, it's not completely hard. It's not neither trivial nor hard. So that's why it's a good exercise. But in general, this problem is just ridiculously complicated. And to show that two knots are not the same, using Reitermeister move is essentially out of question. We essentially have no way to do that. Still, a few small examples are highly recommended uh, also to get kind of a good visual feeling for those knots. So um, with a bit of experience, you can tell that the top knot, for example, is the end knot. Uh, it's not so difficult. And with a bit of experience, you can tell that K and K prime are actually also the same knots. I will comment on that. As we go along, I just say here that I, I won't do it, but I kind of highly recommend this, to at least try it on, on those knots here. Okay, so Reitermeister moves is our, if you want, our definition of equivalence, but it's really hard to apply in practice, so what we actually want are uh, invariants of knots. And I already showed you one, we'll come back to that in a second, um, to the three coloring. So that's what we did last time. So uh, the three coloring, uh, I'll show you a video in a second. So the trefoil had nine three colorings and what is always tricky is that we count the monochromatic colorings as colorings. So every knot had a, has at least three and the non-trivial ones, the three colorable ones have more than three. In this case, um, it's not so hard to convince yourself that uh, the, knot tref the trefoil knot has nine and the magic is, I show you actually the proof now in a video that this doesn't depend on the projection. So not, no matter what projection you have of the trefoil or not, you always have nine three colorings of it. And we check that because three colorings is invariant under the Reitermeister moves. So let us see that actually in action. 
um, in a little video which hopefully loads. There you go. I need to pull it over. So um, the, the question of three coloring knots, in, in this video the colors are blue, uh, red and yellow. So you have the three coloring of a knot and remember that three coloring means in around each crossing you see all different colors. So you have three strands. So this is not a good picture, right? So you have yellow, yellow, blue, that's, that's bad. And by convention, the monochromatic coloring, so whenever every crossing is just monochromatic, that's also a coloring, right? So either all three appear or just one color. So here for the trefoil, and then it's actually, um, that, that's exactly what it is, with either one or three colors, right? So the, the two coloring here with yellow, yellow, blue is not good, the other two are good, and then we just can easily count the number of colorings, the monochromatic ones, three of them, and to just vary the colors along uh, the arcs. So the coloring number, well, the coloring number, uh, so that I call C in the lecture, is uh, nine in this case. And clearly that knot has coloring number three. It only has the monochromatic solutions. So. Um, we know, we'll see in a second, or we already know from last time that it's not invariant, so the trefoil is not trivial. Um, if you try this for this knot, well, you just start somewhere, so the next should get yellow, otherwise it doesn't work, but now we are kind of stuck, so what, how do we color the remaining one? Um, no matter what you do, it should get blue from, from the bottom, and it should get yellow from the top, so you're stuck, and this guy has only the trivial colorings, the monochromatic color. Okay, and that's what you, in principle, can do for every, absolutely every knot. So here's what, what I list. That's what we know right now. So the trivial knot has three, the uh, trefoil has nine, and the figure eight knot has three. And the proof why this is an invariant is nicely illustrated now. So essentially what we need to check is how the coloring behaves under the redim as the moves. And, well, let's say you have red coloring on the left-hand side. And the point is, this is local, so it's, it's, it, at the boundary, it's fixed. The boundary is red, and there's no problem to fill in uh, the remaining color. And of course, you can go back and forth. So the number of colorings is invariant under the randomized that one move. I also showed you the randomized that two move, but in animation, it looks a little bit nicer. So the randomized that two move, this move. So let's assume we have colored the right-hand side, what is it? Uh, red and yellow, again, the boundary points are fixed, so you want the same coloring on the other side, and you can actually fill it up. There's a unique way to fill it up uh, using the third color here, and there's a way to go back and forth. So this shows that it's, and you do all cases, like this one as well, and this shows that it's invariant under Rademeister 2, and you do the same nonsense for Rademeister 3. I at least want to have it once, um, but well, there you go. There are some cases. It's, it's a case-by-case case check, and you can always check um, that it works out perfectly well. There are a few cases, but it's really not hard. You just list all the cases. Okay, uh, so this shows that actually it's a not invariant. Otherwise, uh, said otherwise, so from a diagram, we get a natural number, the number of colorings. Right? From this one, we get three. From this one, we get nine. And from the final one, we get three. So, and actually I showed you up to right the moves, which is the same as knots. Diagrams up to right the moves are knots. So it's a knot invariant. Um, and this shows us that the first two are not the same because three is not nine. And the second one is also not the same as the bottom one. But we can't tell anything, we can't say anything about the top and uh, the bottom. So we can't compare them right now. Okay. Very good. Um, so, and that's the whole point of knot theory. We always have invariance, we compute it, it should be fairly easy, but we might run into the problem that we still can't tell certain knots apart. Okay, very good. Um, so, what I would like to do today is I would like to show you infinitely many knots and infinitely many uh, different knots. And this is just from the outset a non-trivial question because I would need to argue why the knot I write down is not something like the unknot. Uh, so we want to use invariance to actually do that. And a good way to construct infinitely many things, remember from the surfaces, is a connected sum construction. And for knots, we have exactly the same. So um, we had this for surfaces, and it was really great. Uh, remember, there was just a 
the funny hash symbol. And we have exactly the same for knots, and it gives us a really cool tool um, to study knots. It's exactly the same idea. You have a knot diagram on the left-hand side, a K, just a little arc points outwards. You just pull it out, and something random happens in the little box, and the same for L. And what we did we do for, for the surfaces was a two-dimensional operation. So we were poking a hole in left surface, right surface, and connecting them by a tube. Well, this is one dimension lower, so we cut the knot uh, uh, along uh, the little arc and reconnect it in, in exactly the same way. Show you some uh, more pictures in a second, but it's exactly the same operation. Um, it's very local, so nothing changes at K except at this little arc. Nothing changes at L except at this little arc. And we get a new knot, and um, we denote it very similarly to the connected sum for surfaces by the hash symbol. So the hash is here, kind of a very general operation, um, connect sum. I will show you pictures for this in a second, but we would like to think of it as a multiplication or an addition, whatever you want. Um, and it's, it's an operation that takes a knot and another knot and spits out two other knot, uh, two, uh, another knot. So it's like an addition and multiplication. Take a number, another number, it's multiplication spits out another number. And it satisfies exactly the same properties as before. I show you some nice pictures. In a second, the trivial operation here is attaching the unknot. You'll see a picture in a second. Um, it's commutative. Well, you just turn this picture around, then you have L hash K. And a little mental yoga shows you that it is associative as well. It, the proof is essentially the same as for the surfaces. So here are the pictures. So if I have a knot like the figure eight knot, and I have a knot that is called J now, but anyway, and I have a knot uh, like the trefoil, I just reconnect it along a little bridge. Right? So I, here, I can reconnect them along here. And I get a new knot, which seems to be more complicated than the original knot. If you just pull in an unknot, well, you can just pull out this king here, just squeeze it in. So if you pull out an unknot, nothing changes. So the unknot is actually the one operation in this uh, setting. And here's a proof, for example, of commutativity. So if I merge a knot to another knot, that I can kind of shrink it until it's very, very small, and move it around the knot to a, uh, so this is well-definedness, and move it around the knot to any position I like to, and spit it out again. So it actually doesn't matter where I apply my little box. I could have applied it here, for example, as well, and the result would be the same. And I say it again how the proof works. You just shrink one knot to this very small, you move it around the other knot, and wherever you want to pop it out again, you pop it out again. And similar pictures prove associativity and um, what is it? Commutativity of the operation. So this is well-definedness. I just say it doesn't matter where I apply my, my little box operation. Really the same as for surfaces, right? It looks very similar. It's actually a bit simpler. It's one dimension lower. Um, but it's a cool operation to produce new knots out of well, given knots, out of old knots. And what we can do, for example, is this one. And the proof, proof is very cute. Um, so if you have two knots, then C3 was my coloring. Remember, uh, it was here. C3 of the trefoil was nine. That's the number of colors, the number of three colors. Uh, then the number of three colors of the new knot is given by a simple formula. So it's just a product of the colors, number of colors, and then you divide by three, and you see in a second why you divide by three. And yes, note that this always gives an integer. So um, those things are always divisible by three. And it works as follows. So I just have a certain number of colorings on the left. I have a certain number of colorings on the right. Good. So that's what I know um, from the outset. And I connect them along the new arc. Okay. Up to commutativity, I make the choice now. I say the coloring from K goes over to L. So this little arc here in K had some color, which in my picture here is this uh, light blue. So I just don't change the color at K at all. I just pull it over. And I can kind of assume that this little arc is also colored blue. So it's this operation for blue, blue, to blue, blue. So I fixed a color on the left-hand side, and I push it to the right-hand side. OK. So this is fixed by k. Very good. And so this has then 
one over three times the number of colorings from before. Why one over three? Because I already fixed one color. Right? So it's a number of total colors, but I already fixed one via k, so I get one over three on the other side. One over three times the old number to fill it in, which is exactly uh, what we wanted to show. So the product is then the number uh, of colorings. And the only, the one over three comes here really just from, and I fix for k already a coloring of the strand, so I don't have a free choice for L anymore. The free choice is eliminated. It's already uh, light blue, but I can still fill in the remaining ones. Right? If you free color a knot, you always start with some strand and give it a, one of the three colors and you fill in the rest. So you always get time three because you can always, if you can fill in the rest, you can always fill in the rest in three different ways depending on your starting color. I mean, this is a cool result somehow. Um, the Euler characteristic behaved nicely with hash. Um, and that was for surfaces, and here the coloring, actually very, very simple, a closed formula, a very simple one, right? So, uh, A times B over three for the number of colorings of the hash sum of two knots. The, kind of a nice and simple argument. Just fill in the rest, and uh, the one over three comes from the choice that I make on K. I could equally make the choice on L. The picture is completely uh, symmetric. Uh, now I can prove for you that there are infinitely many knots, um, which is not trivial at all, right? So, I mean, if I write down a random picture, it's very likely to be one of the old ones, so how can I produce new knots, actually? Um, I want to use the hash sum, but I kind of need to make sure that the new knot I produce is not trivial, and this is the way how we do it. But this is a knot invariant. So we just need to find an infinite number of knots that have a different number of three colors. And the argument is pretty simple. We start for the, for the trefoil. It's the easiest non-trivial knot. Um, and it has, let me just pull it up again. It has those nine colorings. Uh, note that nine is three to the three squared. So I should have written that probably here somewhere. So this is clearly three cubed, which certainly is bigger than three, I guess. And that's the only thing you really need here. I will comment on that in a second. But for now, just we have nine colorings, which is more than three colorings. And if you just remember what we did here, we always kind of multiply and divide by three. And as soon as you start with more than three, you get more than three uh, in, a, in a certain way. And I will show it to you now. So if we start now with the case hash of a lot of tori, uh, sorry, tori, of a lot of trefoil knots, um, then you inductively apply this formula. So you pull out one over three times the hash k minus one, and you just keep on going. So you pull out the nine from, so this guy here is nine. Remember, this one here is just this one. You pull out the nine, and you still have a three remaining. Right? So the nine doesn't really cancel with the one over three. It leaves, leaves the three. So we went one step down and have three times a certain number, and then you just continue up to, well, pull it out once again, you get three squared, k minus two, and so on and so on, until you hit, uh, this is wrong, until you hit three times k minus k plus one. So this one has k squared again, uh, so three to the k minus one times k squared is uh, three to the k plus one. So the cased hash of a trefoil needs that many, has that many colorings. It's quite a big number, so let us double check. So for k equals one, it should be, uh, three cubed, uh, sorry, three squared, which is the number of colorings of the trefoil. If you do it twice, you should get 27, and you get three cubed. Anyway, just note here the argument that I always pulled out a nine in each step, and nine always gives a factor of three if you multiply it by one over three, so the number of colorings grows in each step, um, and we get an arbitrary number of colorings here, and each one of them is therefore different because well, the number of colorings was an invariant. So they're all different. The hash sum of the trefoil, they're all different knots. So we have now an infinite family of, of, of essentially of hashed trefoils, and of course, of inequivalent knots in general. So they're all equivalent, right? Because they have a different number of colorings. So each one of them, so this typo is, uh, is, is this one is still, remember, uh, three to the k minus one. So they have a different number of three colorings with infinite number of knots, and that's a cool argument. It's just, just if I would have asked 
just let's say Friday, you give me an infinite number of nots, at least I wouldn't be sure how to do it um, because I always need to check somehow that I don't write down a, a family of nots that just look different but are all the same in the end. And here we have used the coloring to produce an infinite number of different nots. That's pretty cool. And what was so special about the trefoil? Essentially nothing. As soon as you have a knot with, which is three colorable, so where this uh, number here is strictly bigger than three, you can just can apply the same argument and you get this infinite family of, of knots. I, I think this is a really cool argument of somehow using um, the three colorings and just the hash, so you can produce an infinite number of inequivalent knots. And using this description, I, well, we can do the following. So I, I just think about multiplication now. So you have prime numbers and you have composite numbers. What is a composite number? A composite number is a product of two other numbers. A composite knot is a product of two other knots. And we don't, well, a composite number is not one times three, for example. Three is not a composite number. Um, so you take out the trivial, uh, the trivial operation. So in this case, we assume that neither of them is the unknot, and we call all of them composite, and we call all the others prime. So uh, like, like in multiplication, right? So it's a prime knot or a composite knot. Really like for multiplication. So this is clearly a composite knot. Maybe you can't see it right now, so let me just split it open. Um, so whatever the right-hand side is, it's, well, it's a, a hash of two non-trivial knots, so it's, uh, it's a composite knot, it's not a prime knot. And it's actually not so easy to apply, and I will show you today a, a very fascinating theorem. So if you remember, one of the first theorems ever is Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many primes. So I will show you that there are infinitely many prime knots um, using kind of the idea of the ideas that we have seen in this lecture. So right now it's not really easy to decide which knot is prime because as soon as we have a factorization, it's like for primes, as soon as we have a factorization, it's clear that it's not. But how to find the factorization is highly non true And note that I'm completely cheating here actually. We actually haven't showed yet, for example, that this is not the unknot. So right now, this is a composite knot, but right now actually we don't know. So I was cheating a little bit. So we don't know yet that the figure eight knot is not uh, trivial, which is a little bit disappointing because it obviously is non-trivial, but we still can't show that. And remember the problem was that this one is not three colorable. I showed you the animation. Anyway, so prime knots under this factorization, and we would like to, um, so we, we will study them in a second again. But let me show you another invariant. Um, so eventually what we would like to do is, here's a second invariant, is to write down a list of knots, like a table. Like someone studying DNA, I showed you the DNA picture, really would like to just open a table, um, probably somewhere online, not in the book, but a few years ago they did this still in the book. And they would like to say, okay, I have a knot here, or can I kind of somehow find it in this table? It's position 12 in the table, or whatever. Uh, so we kind of need a good way to list them, and the crossing number is the best one. So you list cr cr numbers by the uh, crossing, uh, crossings, cr knots by their complexity, and the complexity measure I would like to apply is the crossing number. And it's very, very simple idea it's just the smallest number of crossings in any projection. So I would first define the crossing number of a projection is just the number of crossings you see, but projections can be misleading. So here is the projection of the unknot, and the crossing number of this projection is one because you see one crossing, but the unknot obviously shouldn't have crossing number one. That would be a very silly definition. So you take the minimum over all of all projections. So although this diagram has crossing number one, the knot doesn't need to have the same crossing number. And that's kind of obviously an invariant because we take the minimum over all projections. It's really hard to compute. So let's do some examples here. So the crossing number of the unknot is zero because I don't see any crossings. The crossing number of the trefoil is three. 
Can we actually see that already? Well, I see a not, I see a projection of the trefoil with three crossings. So what we know is the crossing number cannot be, uh, sorry, cannot be bigger than three. Um, and it, if you play around with it, we have showed that it's not trivial, so it can't be zero either. And you kind of cannot write down any knot with uh, one or two crossings. If you try that, like on a piece of paper, it only takes you five minutes to convince yourself that every non-trivial knot has at least three crossings, which implies that the trefoil has three crossings. And it's, a, it's an invariant in a very strict sense, so if crossing number is zero, then your knot is actually the unknot. Um, and here's another one. So the crossing number is also related to uh, the hash. And this is really just saying the hash is a more complicated knot than its individual pieces. So um, prime knots are those with the smallest possible uh, crossing number that you see, if you want. So that's, uh, again, the, the proof is really simple. I showed it to you in a second. But um, kind of fun fact here, one of the big open, pro pro big open questions in knot theory, so everyone believes that this is true, but nobody can prove it. So it's one of the big open problems in knot theory, which is still a, a very active field of research. So you get the inequality fairly easily, um, and the equality, and nobody knows how to do it. But it, it's kind of clear from zillions of calculations that this should be true. Again, it shows you a little bit how delicate some of those notions actually are. Say it again, the crossing number is the minimum of all projections. To read it off for one projection is easy, but to read it off for all projections is a bit tricky. But for alternating knots, which we'll see next time, you can actually do it. For alternating knots, um, the crossing number is what you see, which then makes it a really good invariant of those alternating knots. But for now, we can't do that. We will do that next time. So let me postpone um, the alternating knots to next time. Let me just show you the proof. Um, there's a second proof, which should appear in a second. Uh, so <laughs> the point is, k hash l has a projection with this number of crossings. So the real crossing number is the minimum of all projections. So it's at most uh, k plus l. And that's, that's the proof. Compared to the equality, which we don't know how to prove, uh, this is actually not so hard. So you're just saying the following. Let me go back to um, the little nice box pictures, which are somewhere here. So this has whatever, uh, three crossings. This has four crossings. So this clearly has seven crossings in its projection. So the crossing number of the new beast is at most seven. It could be smaller, but it's clearly at most seven. You just, you just add up. Uh, along the pictures. Blah, 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 blah. Very good. Uh, somewhere here. And why I'm telling you this, because we get exactly the same statements as for numbers. Every number is a unique uh, composite of prime numbers. Every knot is a unique composite of prime knots. Well, the prime knots play the same role um, as the crossing. Uh, sorry, as, uh, as the primes, uh, hence the name. So uh, the unique factorization theorem, here you go. Um, the unique factorization theorem from arithmetic in terms of knots. This is also sometimes called not arithmetic for the obvious reason. So you can play around with those um, and define various versions of knots, uh, rational knots, for example. Okay, so the next one. Um, I would like to answer is, all right, that's classical theorem from arithmetic. It holds another classical one is Euclid's proof. So Euclid's proof that's, I don't know, 2,200 years ago or so, um, that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So we better kind of would like to make sure that there are infinitely many prime knots. It would be kind of a nice result. Um, and I show you infinitely many prime knots. Right now, we don't know a single prime knot, by the way. Uh, but uh, we'll, I'll show you infinitely many. The trefoil is one of them, for example. The trefoil is obviously a test case for anything anyway. Uh, that's a very, very strange definition. Uh, so I write, it, the complication will va vanish in a second when I show you the pictures. But for now, I just write A is congruent to B for two real numbers if they differ by an integer. So pi and pi plus one are congruent in uh, this definition.
And I, okay, a very strange definition. I just put it here and then I just put up the pictures. So the torus knots are obtained as follows. They are knots in three space which you can put on the torus. And it works as follows. They come with two numbers um, who are co-prime, so P and Q, for example, two and three, or five and seven, so co-prime numbers. And what you do is you put, the, you obtain the knot on the torus. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a second. And those two numbers just measure how often it winds around the meridian. So here's the torus. The torus has two natural well, circles you can draw, the meridian M and the longitude L. And the two numbers would measure how a curve winds around, how often it winds around uh, the longitude and how often it winds around the meridian. So this gamma, for example, winds around the meridian three times, one, two, three, and around the longitude once, it just goes around once. And that's exactly what those two numbers, P and Q, are. They just tell you how often you go around the meridian and how often you go around the longitude. And what you get is a knot in three space if you think of the torus as sitting in three space itself. Here's another picture if you want to think of these as living in our favorite polygon decomposition. Two, three means I have two points here and three points, so this is two, and three means I have three points here. And it goes around the torus like this. Two, three, it winds around the torus. Uh, in this case, depends a bit what you call the meridian, the longitude, it goes around uh, two times the meridian and it goes around three times the longitude. And you do it the other way around, everything turns around. So the two here are two points at the bottom, and the three here are what was marked color blue. The three here are the three points along uh, the horizontal line. The vertical line, I guess, it's not horizontal. And the five seven, maybe we can do the five seven, should count five along here and seven along here. And for, for any co-prime number, the co-primeness, if you think about it a little bit, will make this picture into a closed loop. So this is actually a closed loop on the torus. So it goes out here, comes in here, and so on. And we'll close it up uh, on the torus. And these beasts are called torus knots. And they just come with two integers, p and q. The knots that live on a torus. And they turn, they not turn out to be prime. So they're all prime knots. So they're inf there are infinitely many of them. I will show you in a second that they're also inequivalent. So there are infinitely many of uh, these knots for each QMP. There are many, many more prime knots. There's certainly not a classification of prime knots. But I wanted to show you um, the, the uh, analog in knot theory of Euclid theorem. Uh, so there are infinitely many primes. There are infinitely many prime knots. The proof is very, very hard, or well, not very hard. The proof is okay, but kind of, I have it on the slide, but I won't go into details if you want to read it. Um, but um, it's, it's kind of intuitively clear that it should be true. And the proof is a little playing with a visual geometry, if you want. Turns out that the crossing number of the torus knot is known. It's p minus one times q. Remember, the crossing number is an invariant, so we get infinitely many. Uh, different knots because you have this uh, equality of the crossing numbers. So um, already for p equals 2 where the first number is 1, uh, so you just have 1 here, so then the crossing number is q and you can just go through all q's and you get a whole family of different knots. So why do I do this? Well, look at the theorem. The theorem just says the knots are prime, but they could be all the same. And now I'm using an invariant again, um, in this case a crossing number, to verify that they're not all the same. But it's always the same game. So you write down a potential family and you apply um, some invariant onto the family to make sure that they are not equivalent. So in this case, I only show that 2, q are not equivalent, but they're actually all non-equivalent. Up to some symmetry on the knots. So those two, if you swap the numbers, for example, because you can just turn the torus around, the picture of the torus, uh, they actually are equivalent. But up to that silly symmetry, there is no other symmetry uh, in between the torus knots. And 
This gives you a way, in, in the end I'm not going to do that, you should see a little list in a second to just list the number of prime knots with n crossings, so with crossing number n. And you might want to remember the first one of them, so I will never show you a knot with 30 crossings, so you don't need to remember that number for, for 13, but you can really list them, that's the whole point. So you, if you look online, you will find lists of those uh, knots, and they are all listed, so if you're now coming from some biology and want to check what kind of knot your DNA is forming, you just check the online encyclopedia and whatever, it comes out that you have an 11 crossing knots, one of them, one of the 552. Maybe the only important numbers here are, maybe the first ones here, I'll show you some pictures in a second. So there's only one knot with zero crossings. I can actually draw that one for you. So here's the knot with zero crossings. Um, there are no knots with one crossing or two crossings. If you try to draw a knot with one crossing, you just draw a crossing and now you need to connect the strings, for example, like this, uh, or you can connect the strings like this, so they're both the unknot, and you can play the same game with two. So the first non-trivial knot has three crossings, and um, I guess instead of me drawing it, let me just pull up the picture again. So this one here is the only knot with three crossings, uh, so that's something you can apply now, right? So if you see a knot with three crossings, it has to be the trapper knot from this classification. Uh, also, I didn't prove it, but I will show you a, a different one in a second. It's actually pretty cool. So up to seven crossings, roughly, you don't have too many knots, actually. So if you randomly draw a knot with seven crossings, it's likely to be trivial. That's, that's what it, this table is saying because you have so few of them for uh, seven crossings. Yeah. But the number here is much bigger, as you can see. And obviously, at one point, this, this stops. So I think 22 is the last one where it is known, maybe 23. Uh, people, mathematics is developing very fast. So, but it eventually, it of course, stops. So you can't list all of them. You just can list small numbers of them and hope that your knot will fit into this. So let me skip um, the proof. And yeah, so this is a statement that we had before. And we see the proof later um, using a new technology. The, the last invariant we see, the cipher surfaces that we meet later. But here's, for example, this table of knots. Um, way better off just drawing them. I just show them to you. So there's one knot with zero crossings, a trivial knot, one knot with three crossings, one knot with four crossings, one, two knots with five crossings and so on, and this is how they look like. And this is, for example, a torus knot, uh, that's 2.7, it runs around seven times the meridian and two times uh, the longitude, and this is just how you list all of them. So if you have a problem in general in knot theory, you open the book of knots and you will find a list of those beasts, and they're usually, well, I don't have much space on this slide, they're usually listed with some invariance, so um, the number of three colorings or something is usually listed here as well. And that's the whole point of some of knot theory because classification of knots is out of reach. So it's not like for surfaces I can write down an easy statement, this is the best we can do. So we, if you make a lexicon, uh, a lexicographical kind of a, a huge book of all knots up to a certain point, obviously. And then whenever you have a problem in life, uh, you just check your knot. So in particular, if you believe me, this table, let me just go back to the very first slide. So there's only one knot with four crossings. So no matter what you do here, um, those two knots have to be the same. There's only one knot with four crossings. Uh, you just need to convince yourself that the crossing number is what you see. So it, it, essentially, you just need to prove that it's neither the trefoil nor the unknot, because it could have a smaller crossing number. And we know that it's not the trap oil. We don't know yet that it's not the unknot. Somewhere here. Um, yeah, exactly. That's the question I wanted to address. Let me see. Yeah, perfect. So, kind of, certainly we, we need to do that. And um, I will solve that question for you. Not today anymore, but I will kind of show you what we will do to solve that question. Right now, we can't remember that. Uh, let me just pull it up again. Um, we had this coloring and it didn't work. So if you do it, let me just stop here. 
uh, the, this one here should get blue from this picture, but as you can see here, it can't get blue, so we're kind of stuck, and it doesn't have any nice fake colorings except, of course, the boring ones. So we, somewhere here, I had that, uh, so exactly, so we, we can tell the, the trefoil is different from both of them, but we don't know yet whether the, um, the figure eight knot is trivial. Obviously it isn't, it just showed up on my list of knots, so it better shouldn't be trivial. Um, so we somehow need to um, have a better way of coloring. And the idea is as follows, and we do many more examples in a second. So instead of really thinking about colors, which is very powerful, we can also think about coloring things with numbers. So here's a zero, here's a one, and here's a two, for example. And we can do that. I can do another one for you. Uh, maybe the two comes here, uh, the zero comes here, the one comes here, something, uh, whatever. Um, another coloring, Pff, whatever. Uh, the one goes here, the two goes here, and the zero goes here, something like that. And we observe the following. Around each crossing, when you add up the numbers you see, I'm going to do another one for you, maybe a monochromatic one. So something like two, two, two. Yeah. When you add up all the numbers you see, you get a number that is divisible by three. So if I add up all the numbers here, I get three, so it's divisible by three. If I add up all the numbers here, I get uh, six, I guess. It's divisible by three. If I add up all the numbers which is colored zero, I get zero, which is divisible by three in a very silly way, but it's still divisible by three. If I would add up all ones, I get three, which is divisible by three. So actually, a three coloring in this sense, I mean, the colors are very nice, but this is kind of a more mathematical way of doing it, is a coloring of the arcs of your knot with numbers such that around each crossing, the numbers uh, add up to a number that is divisible by three. And this is where our little three comes in. That sounds like we can generalize that to a actually anything. So we can study higher dimensional colorings, higher colorings if you want. So that's just what I said. So what can we say about those numbers? They all are divisible by three in all of these situations. But if you have, oh, I should show you this one as well. If you have something like a two, two, one, a coloring that we don't like, uh, with two colors, with only two colors present, it gets five. That's not divisible by three. So this seems to work out uh, perfectly well, and it does. So, uh, oops. So here we just I just list them all again. So the disallowed colors, um, whatever, one, two, two, would add up to five. Uh, what else can we do? Zero, zero, one would add up to one. What else could we do? Two, zero, zero, for example, would add up to two. So none of these are divisible by three. And here, whatever. 2, uh, 1, 0, add up to 3, uh, 1, 1, 1, adds up to 3. So all of these are divisible by 3. And we can use that to generalize the notion of coloring as follows. So I call it a P coloring for any P. I color my, my knot now with the numbers from 1 to P minus 1. It gets a bit harder to imagine. You really should think of it in terms of numbers now, such that around every crossing, the sum is divisible by P. And kind of by the very same magic as before, the Reidemeister magic, this will be a not invariant, it's called a P color. And everything we did for, for, for colorings works exactly in the same way for P colorings. So we have the number of P colors, and um, it's P. So for a fixed P, there are at least five of them uh, sorry, P of them, obviously. For P equals five, there would be five of them because you can always um, kind of find those monochromatic ones. So the constant coloring is always a P coloring. So the number is at least P and it's exactly the same um, as before. Like everything beyond P is, is interesting. And why we do that, well, we can't see it today anymore, but let me already spoil the story. I will jump in here again. So next time I will do this one again for you is um, because, let me just show you the picture, because of the, if you again want to think of them as colors, 
then um, the trefoil, not the trefoil, the figure eight not is actually five colorable, which shows that it's not trivial and also shows that it's not um, the trefoil. Okay, so what have we seen today is, well, the last notion was this notion of, of coloring here for any P. And then you have, a, for any P, you have this uh, invariant now, a P coloring, and it's a very, very strong invariant of your knot. And kind of the only thing that is really missing is a way to compute this coloring. It gets pretty messy. You would expect that it gets pretty messy, but it's actually very nice. And there's an algorithmic way of doing this. There's an algorithmic way of checking whether a knot is P colorable for any uh, prime P. So if you ever come up with a knot, and I ask you, is this not trivial? Um, a kind of a fool's proof way of doing it would just be to run this algorithm and check that it's uh, not trivial. So let me show you the picture one more time. So that's really the main invariant we have right now. Um, this is the three coloring. So let's say blue is zero, uh, red is one, and green is two. And you check around each crossing. They're always divisible by two. Um, and that's uh, track one. Okay, um, that's it for today.